Okay, it's time to get involved, Richard. It's time to activate the part of your brain that you've sort of like been passively training for the past eight years to snap out of just whatever drudgery that your day is bringing and podcast. Do you feel that? Do you know what I mean? I feel no matter what kind of day I'm having, we're good enough at this now. Not even good enough at it. We've just objectively exercised the muscle. Well, it's not that, yeah, it's not a case of being good at it. It's just, it's not very hard. <laughs> and that's also not to say I'm having a particularly bad day today or anything. Just that. Yeah, I, I would you know, say, like, it's been I, a bit of a slog. I, I watched a um a film the, this <laughs> afternoon, which took me, you know, it was a, a tough one to get through. Mm-hmm. Was it uh, Agent Cody Banks 2 or Joker, Folly Ado? Do? Uh, yes, which of those sequels? Uh, no, yes, it was Agent which Cody Which sequel Banks 2. did I enjoy less? <laughs> because, okay, let's do it. What, what do you think is a, is, um, was a worse experience for you, Folly Ado or Destination Absolutely, London? Absolutely, Folly Ado. And do you think each sequel would be improved if it was Joker, Destination London and Agent Cody Banks, Folly Ado? Kind of. Mm. I mean, there are elements of. Uh, I mean, there's elements of folly I do in uh, Agent Cody Banks too. There's very little Destination London in um, in Folly I Do, which takes place firmly in Gotham, New York. Yeah, you you would have to get quite creative with how you're interpreting Destination London as a subtitle for it to work for totally. Joker too. But I don't I don't believe it impossible, but. No, yes, here we are. Welcome everyone to the Cold Pops Podcast. My name is AJ and I'm joined by Richard. And every couple of weeks here on the Cold Pops Podcast, we examine a new film franchise. This year we're only doing film franchises consisting of a single film and its sequel. And after, or God, prequel. a years long campaign, mm. a years long campaign to get us to cover the Agent Cody Banks duology, uh, Discord user and Patreon member member uh skippy williamson Mm -hmm. (laughs) not to be confused with one of the producers of crank uh (laughs) he he finally he campaigned there was a whole instagram thing i wish i paid more attention to and could accurately describe uh right now but uh i I didn't (laughs) what happened richard what well yeah skippy was posting posting agent cody banks memes for for the better part of a year really um this this Mm. Uh, cover Agent Cody Banks Instagram page popped up and then started commenting on all of our posts on Instagram and uh, yeah like you said mm-hmm. a very hard fought campaign one that has been yeah like since the days of Big Fat Liar uh, Skippy Williamson the very same suggested- person Tried to get us to do Big Fat Liar for a long time. Giving us our second Frankie Muniz duology if you consider Big Fat Liar mm. to be erroneously a Frankie Muniz yeah, yeah. duology, even though he's only in the exactly. original and much more famous film. Uh, but yeah, but yeah, he's so succe- big, and he's, big what's left? Guy. What did he do yeah. other than Malcolm in the Middle in these two franchises? <laughs> Nothing. He raced cars. Well, interesting you should say that because yeah, so Agent Cody Banks and Agent Cody Banks to Destination London are the second and third time we've seen him on this podcast, on the Cult Pop Show podcast. Although you and I have mm. four Cult Pop Show watched one other film that he's in. Can you remember what it is? Oh, um, yes, I can. No, I can't. Uh, I'm thinking of every cameo he's had where he plays himself, and it's like, what if Frankie Muniz sucked? You know, what if he was self-deprecating and he's a bit of a little shit? I remember he has sex with Cher in Stuck on You, but we haven't watched that for the podcast. <laughs> All right, okay. And to be clear, the character is playing, the character is Frankie Muniz and the character is Cher. They're each playing themselves. Right. And there's this very uh, terribly aged cutaway where you see a probably a 50-year-old Cher in bed with a 15-year-old Malcolm in the middle. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's like it's like after they've had sex and the joke is like, ha-ha, imagine if Cher and Frankie Muniz were having a an affair. Yeah, right. It's like a cutaway gag, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. Uh, he plays Buddy Holly in Walk Hard, which we covered ah, for you, the now defunct... Yeah. Um, uh, generic underscore movie underscore podcast, but there are there mm. there are a couple of opportunities we could have to see him. He is in Doctor Doolittle two. He's in Sharknado three. Um, ah, okay. He's yes. also in the uh, half baked, totally high. 
Mm, okay. Is there is there a sequel to My Dog Skip? I don't know. I, about, I just googled that. Like that. Uh, there's not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, while you were talking, the thing while about you were dog movies, about there's not often yeah. uh, a place to go in a sequel <laughs> because yeah. the dog usually dies. I'm assuming Skip dies. I don't remember. I don't but. remember. I remember my sister finding it incredibly sad, and that would probably only happen if the dog died. I can't imagine what else it would be. Right? It's got to be. I remember dog. there was a review for something years ago that we read from um uh what's his face roger ebert and it, it was essentially just like hey this is good i'm like that fucking piece of shit my dog skip do you remember that <laughs> yeah vaguely. and it was like he was just talking about how it was like all scatological humor and like this fucking terrible thing mm. and we were like damn dude really god, he would have hated it. agent cody banks yeah god it's <laughs> scatological AF. it's not uh yeah mm-hmm. agent cody banks came out in 2003 and then was followed only one year later by a sequel first one was directed by harold zwart z-w-a-r-t do you recognize that name do you know where we might have seen him before possibly aj i did he did direct another movie we've watched i want to say recently for film franchise fortnite uh, in the last relatively years, recently yeah. yeah but i've i've forgotten what that was so i can still have the element of surprise uh, yeah. when you tell he me. directed the karate kid remake with uh Jordan smith that's right uh yeah yeah, yeah. And has a has a pretty a pretty uh, spotty filmography as well outside of those two films. It's all a bunch of films that are very similar caliber to uh, yeah, the Karate Kid and Agent Cody. Yeah, Banks. it's like um, the Pink Panther. <laughs> I think he did or Pink Panther mm. Two. Uh, long ah, flat balls. <laughs> Mortal Instruments. City of Bones. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Oh, he also directed there Long Flat go. Balls too, so maybe we could cover that. Oh, a second Harold Zwart duology. Yeah, How exciting it's a for Norwegian us. Norwegian comedy film. Uh, yeah, that's my other question. What the fuck is Long Flat Balls? Excuse me? It's called me? like Lange Flat Balle. <laughs> it is like literally if you look at the title of it and in its original Norwegian, it literally just looks like it says Lange Flat Balle. <laughs> Reminds me of that Kirby enthusiasm joke where he keeps sitting on his nuts, and they're like, "It's because you got long balls, Jer- Larry." Yeah, Jerry, long balls, Larry. <laughs> uh, so yeah, AJ, what is Agent Cody Banks a boot? I'm so glad you asked. Agent Cody Banks is a early to mid 2000s family, quote unquote, uh, action comedy that uh, used to get fucking shoveled into cinemas all the fucking time when we were kids, Richard. The, yeah, Agent <laughs> Cody like Banks Agent specifically. Cody Banks. It, yeah, all the yeah. time you go to the <laughs> cinema it's like yeah like you, you talk about the, the the dystopia where you just say uh mm. you know disney will have bought everything so we will say disney in the same way we say movies for like a solid mm. couple of summers we you would say do you want to go see the new agent cody banks and it's it's the same film yeah it's yeah. not a sequel uh yeah yeah sure. yeah, yeah. It's, hey, it's mom, a, can it's i have five dollars um, because that's all it costs to go to the movies in 2003 yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. to go see a, an, an agent cody banks you know how like uh, Avatar reclaimed highest grossing film because it just put got put back in yeah, theaters yeah. again and Titanic's done something similar? It was that kind of situation where they just kept putting it back in cinemas and that is why Agent Cody Banks is one of the highest grossing films of all time. Exactly, yeah. Stole the title back from itself. Yeah. Um, it, well, it, it had gone to Destination <laughs> London, uh, but then yeah, it, it ripped it back. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, continue please, AJ, with the plot. Sorry. Yeah, so Frankie Muniz uh, plays the titular Cody Banks, who is a 15-year-old secret agent. And I know what you're thinking. 15-year-olds don't get to be secret agents. And you've stumbled across upon the delicious gimmick this film presents, which is what if they could be, Richard? Mm. What if a 15-year-old boy could be a secret agent? Um, and uh, essentially, the, the, the main hook of the film is like he's this incredibly capable like as capable as james bond would be at any given like dangerous mission but his new mission he has to talk to hillary duff Mm. but he can't talk to girls which in in theory brilliant brilliant uh you know like delicious little twist of a premise there relatable can't talk to girls because he's a 15 year old boy of course what a great concept in practice, creepy. Creepy 
movie. Very creepy movie. Wow. The the scene where they're like, this is Hilary Duff. I think her name's Natalie something in this film. Mm-hmm. They're like, this is Natalie. We need you to get close to her. And Keith David, who's like the director of the of the CIA, is briefing him. And he's like, we've looked at this 15-year-old girl. We've got her school timetable. We know where she will be at all times. And we've put you in every one of her classes, Cody Banks. Like... In practice, it is a creepy thing to do to have a teenage girl be your CIA mark. Yeah, but at, at, what, at what point does the fact that you're saving the world like outweigh that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Saving the world is more good than stalking a 15-year-old girl is bad, is the, is yeah. the truth this movie posits to you, the audience. Do you not Maybe think that that's a you truth? to make up your own mind. What would what do you think? I think I think I think the American government would absolutely consider that. <laughs> worth no, I'm, doing. AJ, I'm asking you. I'm asking you what you think. Um, I I think I don't want to be burdened with such. AJ, a... J- for once in your life, forget about the U.S. government. Take a fucking Tell me what stand, you think. AJ. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I'm going to do it. I'm going to say no. They should have let uh, whatever was at stake happen and give wow. this girl their privacy. Anyway, Hilary Duff, her dad is like basically being strong armed by an evil com- an evil organization to manufacture nanobots that uh, can unambiguously eat through human flesh. <laughs> is kind yeah. of the <laughs> at the top of it. That's what we're shown as as the the ultimate risk here. Um. So Agent Cody Banks. But no, has God to get forbid we should girl. be creepy to a fifteen year old girl to prevent. <laughs> Bear in mind, Richard, you are the one defending being creepy to a 15-year-old girl. Like, usually we bait each I'm other. I'm the one defending our planet. I think that... I'm defending humanity, easily, AJ. If if Jeremy was here, we'd get him to admit that he thinks being creepy to a oh, 15-year-old absolutely. girl is yeah, the yeah. better decision. And then, we would, and then we, would su- like, we would subtly and slowly take the world-saving stakes out of it until he is just defending so that... that. <laughs> absolutely um so uh yeah so basically he has to get close to this girl in order to see what her father's up to um and yeah it's a movie what did you think of it yeah it's interesting like it's a movie that i hadn't seen before it it sort of missed me i would have been right in the prime age range for it like i i was watching it thinking Mm. like yeah who was this really aimed at because by the time I was like 15, 16, I was sort of starting to get it. That was when I was getting into my more like film nerdy phase and, you know, was excited mm. by things like um, V for Vendetta um, and, mm. uh, you know, Fight Club and shit like that. And so, uh, yeah. Well, in I, 2003 you were, are you saying? No, I'm saying when I was 15. Oh, when you were 15. So when you were the age of Cody Banks, yeah. not the age you were when Cody Correct. Banks came out. Mm. Whereas when Cody Banks came out, I was 10 and probably more the appropriate age. Like films like this are interesting because the window of like enjoyability is so small. Like something like Roger Ebert compared it to Spy Kids in his review and said like, you know, there's not as much Mm. for the adults. So like kids might enjoy it, but unlike Spy Kids, um, you're not going to get much out of this. And, you know, I think we have some really good kids films these days as well. Um, You know, things Mm. like... um, the i mean these are all like animated examples but like the teenage mutant ninja turtles the new one um from last year mm. the um the wild robot i loved but like i i feel like because what's allowed in cinemas these days is becoming a bit more prestigious i mean there's a lot of shit out there still i mean just look at fucking joker folly do um mm. that I don't know. There's like a little sort of like, yeah, like they, they don't make movies like this anymore. This is part of this is a casualty of the death of the mid budget film that people keep talking about as well. Totally. Cause, because I, this rocked my shit when I was nine or 10 and it came out. I thought this was the coolest movie ever. Mm. I definitely like this movie along with ones like the, the live action Scooby Doo films mm. and Kangaroo Jack and Spy Kids as well. They all came around the same sort of time. These movies look and smell like popcorn and candy at Hoyt Cinema to me. Mm. Like this is like the school holiday movie, and it's it's all very exciting. Uh, and so so returning to it for the podcast, I was like, these things don't usually go well for thirty one year old men revisiting movies they liked when they were 10 Mm -hmm. you know usually we get back on board and we're like ah this is actually really boring or really bad now and 
as Agent Cody Banks started, I was like, you know, like some of this pretty fun still some of it some of it still lands i think in the way that it's sincerely supposed to however overall uh it's not very good and crucially there are some delicious little nuggets of problematic corner that i'd love to (laughs) to talk about uh Mm. with you for, for this one in particular more so than destination london i think um but yeah this the the i think this movie is so funny because it opens with uh, no, so there's got to be like an introductory scene where you see what the bad guys are up to or something like that that I'm not remembering immediately. Yeah, well, they, or it's they, like some Mission Impossible. He shows them how they can how the, these nanobots can eat oil, and they're like, "Can they eat yes. anything other than oil?" And he's like, well, "I guess." Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's who's the? It's Ian McShane is the yeah. the lead villain, and Arnold Vosloo from The Mummy, who you mm. always think is um, what's his name? Billy Zane. I thought it was Billy, Billy Zane again. I thought it was Billy Zane till you mentioned it was Arnold Vosloo right now. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the so then it cuts to the the most deletable scene I've ever seen in a movie. Uh, oh. <laughs> like this belongs on the deleted scenes, which is Agent Cody Banks waking up in bed, oh. getting up and having breakfast, and like bantering with his family and it's all there i think to show that he's a normal teenage boy yeah, well, well, right? well so, because, you, but, so you may think aj so you might assume idiot <laughs> and then the next scene he's skateboarding to school it's very cool he's wearing his helmet mm. it's awesome um and a mother accidentally leaves her baby in the car and the handbrake off and it starts well, the baby, sliding the, down the, the, like it's this. A, so it's a toddler and the oh. baby, the, the toddler takes off the handbrake. And yeah, then, it's very, it's very yeah. careful to not blame uh, a young mother for no, any yeah. of these, <laughs> what happened. Uh, and mm. Agent Cody Banks has this legitimately, I thought, pretty well choreographed and shot action scene where he basically has to skate down this really long, like really steep street and stop this kid, this little toddler from crashing yeah. the car. Um, and it's all just like, this should have been the introduction to Cody Banks. I didn't need mm. that him waking up to understand he sh- th- this this is a teenager he shouldn't be able to to be uh, to capable skateboard. of such like incredible yeah yeah and like it is great how like little room for air er- like they may they emphasize how essential cody banks is to saving this kid's life because when he finally does manage to he like gets he climbs on the car and manages to stop it or whatever mm. it screeches to a halt just as a train passes by on the train tracks and like knocks the bumper off the car meaning without a shadow of a doubt if cody banks was not there this child would have been annihilated by a train there is no alternate there is no yeah. wiggle room and he should have been i think he should, I think yeah the have been. and you think it's okay to be creepy to 15 year old girls <laughs> <laughs> and and For toddlers should get hit by trains <laughs> uh, and then then instead of like reaping the rewards for saving a baby because he's it's top secret it's he's a cia agent um, you see, like, the rim of his skateboard, like, flickering with flame from how he was skidding along it, and he, like, picks it up and blows it out. And it's the fucking coolest shit ever, man. Like, this this achieves, not like, genuinely no notes. Say what you want about the rest of the film, maybe, but I thought this scene is totally, like, a kid-friendly James Bond action scene. Totally. You know? Like, it just, it, it's real. it's probably the best scene of the film, I thought. Um... And yeah, so the whole thing is that he went, he, he says in both films, he, he clarifies that how he, cause it's not really an origin story. He clarifies yeah, which that I how he became a junior. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. A junior CIA agent is because he went to summer camp after subscribing to like kids spy magazines. <laughs> and the, the summer camp essentially was like, Hey, guess what? We're actually training young like children to be CIA agents. Don't tell your parents creepy richard it's creepy it's so creepy anytime the phrase yeah. do not tell your parents is uttered in a film or by anyone in real life tell you are parents. the bad guy <laughs> in, in that situation yeah <laughs> you and know what i mean inter- yeah 
it is interesting though yeah like having not seen this movie before i assumed it was going to be an origin story and i was surprised I was right. like yeah, he's waking up because he's just a normal kid um you know really sort of eased me into the film <laughs> i thought that was yeah it's um, actually really useful to get this context that he just bickers with his family sometimes totally totally <laughs> uh yeah and so yeah i was actually i would say sort of quite moved by that um by that opening and then mm. Uh, you know, it also went And then I hated hell. the skateboard scene. Yeah, I, the, I didn't the think it was He catches up to the car and he's like, hey, open the door to the kid. And the kid's like, nope. That's why I thought the kid would die. <laughs> but the, but ah, also, uh, when Agent Cody Banks catches up to the car on his skateboard and he's skating down, it, look, it looks, it's he lives in Seattle, but it looks a lot more San Francisco-ian with the, um, the trains. Yeah, and the, oh, absolutely. They do this in, in Seattle as well. And they've um, steep hills and whatnot. But the... Um, but he catches up to the to the car and he like grabs onto the bumper of it so he's on a skateboard going downhill the car's going downhill and he grabs onto like the rear bumper of the car or i think it's actually the front bumper of the car because the car's going backwards but and tries to stop it like that now he makes no attempt to stop or slow down his skateboard while doing this so he somehow thinks that he will be able to while he is being propelled forward on four wheels that he is going to be able to stop a car that is also being propelled forward without any kind of friction mm. involved or any kind of, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's bad move. And I was like, I mean, so I even at this point, I was like, well, even at this point, I was like, Oh, so he must not be trained yet, but they're just like, mm. Oh, they're, they're going to see this. And they're going to be like, give me that little kid. Um, not in a creepy way, but they're going to be like, give me Malcolm in the middle. Give me Malcolm. Stat. Give me Malcolm. Stat. Yeah. So this was, as you mentioned, yeah, he is, famously malcolm in the middle and you asked me aj to see if i could find out uh when this was filmed around malcolm in the middle um and mm. yeah this was actually uh before he was in malcolm in the middle no no you're right it was after i like objectively knew that wasn't true so i was just waiting for you to yeah, yeah. <laughs> give me the next filmed in season the <laughs> filmed after season four wrapped up so right in the middle Really? Okay, so this, in film. my opinion, that's, that's, it is high, it's height of Frankie Muniz, but I would also say that's shark jump territory for Malcolm in the Middle, total, season, end of season four, I reckon is totally shark jump territory. Um, Interesting, do you, do you think it, here's what it I think shark is, as a shark, I guess where they had Jamie, would it be? Yeah, so, so, okay, uh, the, f I've seen Malcolm in the Middle pretty recently, uh, well, quite a lot of it pretty recently. So I'm not just a freak that knows heaps about Malcolm in the Middle. But uh, season four ends with Jamie being born in what I think is probably the best episode of the show, Sp specifically because it focuses mm. far more on Lois and Francis than Malcolm, um, who is the worst character in Malcolm <laughs> in the Middle. Um, and uh, it's such a fucking great episode about, like, uh, how you... Uh, how family can be important to you even if you don't like them mm. um, because Hamish has, uh, Hamish, what's his name? Francis has to <laughs> deliver the baby from his mother who he famously fucking hates, right? Yeah, so and also no it's one just, wants I to just think it's look at look at that. exactly i think it's such a good piece of television and then but it's the second to last episode of season 4 um then season four ends with the episode where Reese becomes a Christian and creates a hot air uh, balloon. Yeah, and yeah. there's the scene where he's like floating in the clouds <laughs> and it looks insane. It looks like yeah. nothing else you've seen in the show before. And it feels like such a definitive, we're, we're doing a silly one now. Mm. And then season five begins with like the family go to Vegas and there's like a big fantasy sequence and it's just very different. So immediately it's like, mm. you get this like, what I think is what Malcolm in the Middle is about, which is like a cold, hard look at family relationships, mm. is like where the Jamie is born episode is. I think the episode's called Baby, right? They all have really simple titles. And then immediately you get two really strange episodes in a row, one of which ends a season, one of which opens the next season. And I don't think the show, season five's fine, but I think season four is like the height of everything firing off all cylinders. Um, but what I, why I asked that is because Agent Cody Banks 1 is Frankie Muniz at his most Frankie Muniz ever, right? Like, totally, he, yeah. He is, when I picture Frankie Muniz in my head, this is what he looks like. Exactly. I think this is when he was young enough that he was still able to be precocious, dare I say a little bit cute, 
like still got some of this right, boyishness okay. and I'm being to creepy. him. Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> um, whereas Agent Cody Banks 2, filmed only a year later, that's like you can see that's the foundation man. covering his acne and you can see the the like, he is pushing right up against another very specific fr- phase of Frankie Muniz, which is, uh, now he's just too old to be <laughs> charming anymore. Well, and, he, and he looks like, like he that looks for the rest too... of his life. <laughs> yeah, kind of, right? Yeah. Like, like Malcolm in the Middle is is so good. And maybe it's a coincidence. Maybe it's just the show was at its best when he looked this way. But as soon as you notice him start getting older, I feel like the show loses a lot of the... Like, this is when Malcolm starts to become clearly the worst character in the yeah. show. Because... Now he's not even. Now he's getting older and just looks like a man hanging out in this family. Mm. So now it's like Malcolm <laughs> in the top half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Malcolm, Malcolm in the middle middle age. Malcolm, there you go. Wow, yeah, I that's mean, it's good. hardly middle age. If if sixteen is middle age, then you and I are elderly men. Mm. Um. So. Well, if you're a, if you're a, I mean, if you're a woman who has gets pregnant at thirty four or older. It's a geriatric mm. pregnancy. Amazing. What an amazing term to gift women the world over, you know? Mm. Women yeah. who famously are treated with so much respect when it comes to aging totally. the world over. The medical the medical world assigned it to a geriatric pregnancy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, people who are probably already self-conscious about having a child at mm. that age. Um, <laughs> mm. Geriatric bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, but like, speaking of like when this sort of was and, um, for the, the, the Frankie Munez age, he was paid $2 million for the films, which was the highest Holy paid, shit. um, since, uh, Macaulay Culkin. And like, he famously was pretty good with his money and retired at 18. And that's like, mm. he's pretty comfortable not working again from what I just, like you said, he races mm. cars and stuff. Um, and mm. But yeah, it was. He also uh, had to turn down holes to do this film. I, as you know, as uh, cancelled as yeah. th- the beef is, I think that that we live in a better timeline that he was a he was cast totally. in holes. Holes. I don't. I don't see Frankie Muniz amazing. as Stanley Elnats. You know, I can't yeah. see it. Do you see him as Hector Zaroni? Maybe. Or the four eyes. Oh one? yeah, big Hector Zaroni guy, yeah, or, yeah. or um, X-ray. or uh, Mr. X-ray, or or Mr. Sir. Yeah, I or, see Frankie um, Muniz as playing an excellent Mr. Sir, played by John Voight. Also, no, in jo- Megalopolis. Yeah, Megalopolis is a Holes reunion. I've never realised that till right now. <laughs> Isn't um Mr. Sir um what the other guy from um uh, Buster Scruggs? Tim Blake Nelson. Tim Blake Nelson. Isn't that Mr. Sir? No, he, he's he's uh, Mr. Pendansky in right, Holes. Yes. John Voight is Mr. Sir in Holes, and then he also plays Shia LaBeouf's uncle in uh, Megalopolis. Oh, yeah. So it's like they're, they're pretty close characters in both movies. I wonder if they talked about it. I wonder if they talked about both being cancelled and how when they originally... There was a Holes reunion together, they, recently ne- where they neither all was cancelled. showed up um, and had a little fun thing. Was I, I'm Shia thinking of... Here? Huh? I think Shia was, yeah. Was Shia at the Holes reunion? And so and John Voigt was there. Um but yeah, I'm thinking of I can hear um Tim Blake Nelson saying Mr. Sir, which is why I was confused because mm. obviously he mm. sees it more because it's not his character's name. Which is how how names tend <laughs> to work. <laughs> to be fair, Mr. Sir does introduce himself quite iconically in that story in that book and film as well because he's like my name is mr sir you shall address me as mr sir and his real name is like a woman's name or something fucking hilarious like marion uh yeah it is it actually is i think it is it yeah. actually is marion yeah i've got it that is marion <laughs> all right you, you've got the information in front yeah, of yeah holes man what a Shouldn't good movie just... that was See, Hulls, so now good. Hulls is a is like a generational, like a, a cross-generational yeah, thing. Yeah. Like, you can enjoy Hulls at any age. <laughs> Not just the well, movie. Um, also, <laughs> that is the fucking lowest hanging piece. I know. I, 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 that's, when that's, I said no, it, I would have done the same thing. I would have yeah, done the exact same thing. When I said it, thing. I was like, well, I have to. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, Hulls is totally in the same camp 
no pun intended, or that it is definitely that intended. is the lowest hanging fruit, actually. <laughs> as as movies like Agent Cody Banks, but you're so right that one has stood the test of time to become like a generational touchstone. Mm. Uh, because probably because just it's based on it's like higher quality material than totally, Agent yeah. Cody Banks, I think. Um, but yeah, no, that's such a good comparison to make. So maybe Frankie Muniz made the wrong decision by going for this over totally, over yeah. Holes. Um, and maybe mm. maybe he would have been willing to put in the work and and put on a bunch of weight for Holes because mm. Sandy Yelnets are supposed to be a big old fatty according to the book, mm. and then mm. loses that's weight. True. I remember the book. Uh, I remember reading that Shia LaBeouf started putting on weight, which is such a, um, what would come to be very typical of Shia LaBeouf's work ethic, I think. Mm. Uh, and But then Louis Sackar, the author and screenwriter of, I know a weird amount about Holes, apparently, and Malcolm mm. in the Middle, um, uh, like he was like, uh, probably wisely told the child actor starring in his film that he didn't need to put on weight and that it was more about the character growth than anything else totally yeah 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 I mean, when you're dealing with child actors it's like yeah like gr- growing up and the same with um ready player one is that like these were things i was fan of fans of the source material and in both of those stories the character is supposed to start out overweight and lose weight throughout it and as as a as a fatty myself i um mm. i was like you know there was a part of me that was like well, oh my god maybe i could be cast in this role and it'll be that would be the motivation to lose weight um because i remember for ready play one they did like a fully open casting call um and mm. yeah but then uh yeah like you said it's more about character growth and when you're dealing with like teen actors although every play one he was a little bit older um it's kind of just more important to preserve uh that kid Their innocence <laughs> yeah literally <laughs> yeah well, speaking of preserving child actors' innocence, Richard, one thing that I think is fucking despicable about Agent Cody Banks is it is way hornier than I think anyone really remembers it is. You know what I mean? Like, like I, I think that a lot of these family uh, movies around the time, like in a post-Trek world, I think everyone was trying to push the line and see what they could get away with. Trying a little to pull bit one more. over on, on the old, the senses. Yeah, yeah, but there's a big difference between like um i the one i always remember is uh jerry o'connell and kangaroo jack feeling up the female lead in that film because he thinks she's a mirage in the desert and being and being like eight years old watching this and being like i can't watch this in front of my parents um mm-hmm. but the difference is is like jerry o'connell is at least an adult there is the the so basically, to put it in, in like, to summarize it a little simply, I would say that, like, there is a very, very heavy male gaze uh, on Harold Zwart's direction. Yeah, that's just the Zwart style, Agent baby. Cody Banks. Yeah, that's the Zwart's, that's what he's known for, AJ. What's your yeah, fucking you go problem? To his trademarks on IMDb. Um, mm, and that's mm, what exactly. he actually does have a trademark section on IMDb or, or at least on the trivia for this film. There's, like, a director trademark, which is just there's a reference to Norway in the film. <laughs> um so yeah the the firstly he, agent cody banks has a has a handler who is um oh one thing about both of these movies they star some of the most obscure act like people who <laughs> should be played by like david spade are played by someone you've never fucking seen in anthony the world. anderson like i feel like th- yeah well no but that's someone <laughs> i know like who the fuck is the woman who plays the handler in the first film this was their first movie that should be like Jessica Marina Alba Baccarin. or something. You know what I mean? Like it's 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 a role that is written for like whoever the hottest actress of appropriate age was at the time, right? So let's say it should be like Elizabeth Hurley. Yeah, exactly. It's an Elizabeth Hurley and bedazzled kind of role, um, or maybe Austin Powers is a more appropriate. Uh, but yeah, pretty much her her outfit sexualized as hell it is like absurdly unprofessional for what i imagine people are actually asked to wear when they're walking around cia headquarters the, the um, hottest woman of 2003 according to fhm was uh halle berry there we go it's a halle yeah, berry role but actually she's played by second, someone whose name you won't recognize the second was holly valance who's an australian um uh, actress who i actually think would have probably been a pretty good choice for that role that sort of like very 2003 famous you know who it should have been Rachel Stevens. 
No. It should have been celebrity number six. Whoever yes. that was at the time, it would have made, made, a whole, made it a whole lot easier to figure out who mm. celebrity number six was. Very nice. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's there's that. There's a scene where, um, in order to uh, show the like CIA headquarters why Agent Cody Banks is taking so long, they conjure up this hologram of this like sexy lady mm. to talk to fifteen year old Frankie Muniz, and he's like a stuttering mess. And it, I posted this on my Instagram story because it's like the exact same shot <laughs> language as the um the giant joy hologram in Blade Runner twenty forty nine, yeah. and both are even holograms, and both are like narratively telling you this male character is a pathetic small nobody compared <laughs> to this like this like sexual uh beauty that is complete like like that is completely uh taking away all his confidence and power you know mm. like it's the same shot language and meaning behind mm. the shot and it's i thought that was so funny um so yeah and it beat it by 14 years yeah yeah in a much worse movie <laughs> uh now aj uh, i don't know how much attention you were paying during the credits mm. of these films but uh I looked up from my phone uh, during the credits of Agent Cody Banks 2, which I was just letting play out um, as I finished the Sunday crossword, uh, and I noticed a couple of interesting names in the executive producers. Did you see this at all? Uh, I've read enough letterboxed reviews to, I think, get an indication of where this is going. Yeah, so the the, the executive producers uh, listed, um, two of them... Uh, jumped out at me one is jason alexander george from seinfeld Mm -hmm. and the other one is madonna so interesting because what this means richard is that madonna has now got stake in the holy trilogy of spy films because she did that beautiful stranger song for austin powers then did Mm -hmm. uh die another day which i always find so funny came after beautiful stranger and austin powers (laughs) she did a song for the parody of james bond before doing and it just an actual james bond song and then of course being an executive producer on cody banks those are the three big uh secret agent movies yeah yeah exactly uh yeah her production company acquired the script um i don't think she's affiliated with them anymore and also um jason yeah. alexander was uh attached to direct the film originally um but he Weird. does he uh, yeah, yeah i don't know how much he's actually directed but he was um ultimately replaced with uh vic armstrong who was then replaced by um Harold's Wart, but interestingly, um, Wart. Vic Armstrong is a very famous stunt double, and my partner Jess actually worked with him um, a few years ago, and I believe we have a copy of his wow. book uh, somewhere around the house. So I messaged her before, and I was like, "You, you worked with Vic Armstrong, right?" She's like, "Yeah," and I was like, "Yeah, he almost directed um, <laughs> the fucking uh, get you Cody Banks." Wow, dude, just. Take a moment to, t- to drink that in. You are almost connected to Agent Cody Banks. You're not, but you, you're you almost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> uh, Jason Alexander directed a film called For Better or Worse. Um, mm-hmm. And a, a film called Just Looking. Um, doesn't look like he's done much else, though. He might have directed. Maybe he was trying uh, to break into the game. Totally. Um, AJ. I know this might be a random mm. place to bring this up, but I've got some statistics for you. Um, <laughs> I'm so curious. Please tell me. I've brought them. I'm doing them. I'm doing just in the in the way that you like doing them, where we just we gamify it a little bit, and it's essentially where have we seen this actor before? So this mm. is our fourth and fifth Keith David films. Uh, can you yes, name the other three we've too. seen? Them? Um. Mm. Oh, I can never because he's in so many things in like roles like this. Like, mm. is it? I mean, he's a character actor, right? So I feel yeah. like I never, I never like commit to memory what I see him in. But I do always like seeing him. Hmm. I will say that I'd really like Keith David. I just tell me, just tell me the three. I don't. Uh, think I he is in Barbershop. He yep. is in The Chronicles of Riddick and Pitch Black. I think I would have never guessed them. I think totally. that was completely different territory to what I was totally. thinking. <laughs> There's some hard ones coming up. Uh, it's our eighth time, the second film is, uh, it's our eighth time seeing Anthony Anderson. Um, scary Movie 3 and 4. Yep. Transformers, yep. just the first one. Yep. 
Um, I reckon that'll be me, but I reckon that that's what that was a good attempt. That was that was very good. <laughs> Can you please give me some praise? Uh, <laughs> so what you said, just scary movie three and four and Transformers is what you said. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's also in uh, Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle. Of course, so yeah. let's burn this whole place down. Love that scene. Uh, he's in Scream Four. So again, he did okay. uh, he did the parody before wow. doing the actual thing. Um, yeah, yeah. And yeah. he's in Barbershop One and Three which is like an interesting thing where okay. he did the first one when he was like not really that famous. Um, then I didn't do the second one. And then by the time the third one rolled around, he was huge. He's got the whole storyline in Barbershop where he's like stealing an ATM exactly. machine yep. or something. Totally. Hey. It's our one, two, three, f- uh, sixth, sixth and seventh time seeing Cynthia Stevenson who plays uh, the mum. Yes, because when Cody Banks' mum comes on screen, mm. I was like, Jesus Christ, this woman plays the mum in everything. Like, why? Like, I am mm. so used to seeing this woman in a breakfast, a morning breakfast. <laughs> yeah. Like, it, and I was like, I was like, I'm going to look her up because I bet she's fucking been the mother in so many different similar movies. She hasn't. She's been the mother in one very pervasive mm. <laughs> franchise, which is she is the mum in the Earbud movie. Yeah, so she's in Air Bud 2, 4, and 5, and it was also yeah. in Air Buddies and Snow Buddies. Yeah, so that's what I'm picking up on, I think, is yeah. that she's just, I've just seen her play the same character in a lot of Air Bud movies. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, also our fifth time seeing um, the Daniel Roebuck, who plays Mr. Banks. Um, he's well known mainly to, like, to mm. you and I in a different role. Um, but do you mm. know the films we've seen him in? And what is the other role I'm talking about? I, I, so you're talk, he plays Arts yeah. in Lost, who's a character. Um, I feel like this is fair game. He dies in like the second or third episode. You see, he's basically a character who was introduced to be killed off. Yeah, he's in a, a rich funny way. Um, he's a rich Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, what other movies have we seen? Uh, so he is in Final Destination. He's in both okay. Rob Zombie Halloween films, and he's in Phantasm okay. Ravager. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't have remembered that. I can tell you that much. Yeah. Uh, where else have we seen Ian McShane? There's three films. Um, He was in... Oh, no, I just know him from John Wick. We haven't covered them for the podcast. Mm. What else is he in? Uh, there's a role he oh, reprised no, this year. Um, isn't he in like Yellowstone or some shit? <laughs> yeah, I know he reprised that recently. Um, a, a voice role. Mm. Is he in like Inside Out Two? No, he's in uh, Kung Fu Panda. Ah, yeah. He's the he's the villain. Yeah. The first one. He's also in Shrek Three, and he's the bad guy in Pirates of the Caribbean Four. Is he Blackbeard? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Interesting to call him the bad guy and not Blackbeard. And yeah, I, I knew you were going to say that once I said it. Um, I just wasn't 100% confident he was <laughs> Once Blackbeard. I fucked up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then I've got a bunch of actors that we've only seen once before. Um, Frankie Muniz, obviously. Big Fat Liar. Uh, it's our second Hilary Duff film. After Okay, I was going to ask because because I thought like this because like the, the the powerful thing about Agent Cody Banks as a film right is that it's the combining of the Malcolm in the Middle crowd with the Lizzie McGuire crowd, which which shows that would have both been at the height of their yeah. Frankie Muniz guest starred on Lizzie McGuire, and that was when they sort of she found out about the movie and they got talking about it. But we've seen her ah. pretty prominently one other time. Um, people are what people are gonna be it? screaming at their podcasting. I know device. we we watched the Lizzie McGuire movie, but that was mm. for uh, generic. You're gonna podcast. fucking kick yourself when you. I we've, gonna, you and like, I have talked about. No, actually, I talked about with someone else recently. <laughs> Wasn't you? Hey, um, Joe, I've talked about this with someone recently. <laughs> Come on, Hillary Duff. It's right there. Come on. In. Come on. It's another franchise where she's only act- in the first one. I actually feel like it should be so. Like it should be popping. I don't even. I don't even have an image in my mind of what else Hillary Duff is in. Wow. 
Do you know what I think about eight for, uh, quite a lot? We did a episode about riddles years ago, mm. and then it was or it was like the lateral. We did. Yeah. We tried to do a yeah, spin was, on the lateral. My, 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 my version of lateral, yeah. And you were telling me that someone, one of your friends, listened and just said, "Man, you can really lead AJ to water, but you can't make him drink." <laughs> and that has stayed with me. I ever forgot since about you told that. Me someone said that, and then every time we do this game where I've got to guess some arbitrary fact, which would probably just be more interesting if you just told me uh <laughs> i think about how much of a fucking idiot i look <laughs> i completely forgot it that's so funny i was i i think i remember who said that but um no AJ, i'm not going to tell you i'm going to leave it sitting there um and it, i'm it'll oh pop into remind me get the, the podcast of it as it come up um but think about it another franchise where we where she's only in the first one um she's only in the first one yeah I was going to say cheaper by the dozen, but we haven't covered we haven't, that. But yeah, she's also in those. She's in the second one of that as well. Uh, all right, uh, Martin Donovan. Uh, Technically not in the first one as well because it's a remake. Yeah. Um, so I so it just to, to definitively prove I don't know what I'm talking. About. <laughs> uh, yeah, Martin Donovan who plays uh, Hilary Duff's dad. Um, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, what else have we seen him in? <laughs> Nothing, because that, again, is an, a character in this film who should be played by someone more recognisable than he is. Yeah, he's, he's... He's just some guy. Yeah, and he <laughs> plays some guy in Ant-Man. <laughs> uh, interesting. See, exactly. Yeah. Imagine Paul Rudd. Imagine 2003 Paul Rudd as mm. Hilary Duff's dad and Agent Cody Banks. Yeah. That would make so much sense. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, so the, I've got there's a couple more. These are actors who appear in the second film, um, Agent Cody Banks Two: Destination London, which is directed by Kevin Allen, um, whose brother appears in the film as well, Keith Allen, uh, and then Keith Allen's son, Alfie Allen, also appears in the film. Uh, who was Alfie that's a- so interesting. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so yeah, a, directed by his uncle uh, Alfie Allen, brother of Lily Allen, and um, Theon Greyjoy is that him? Mm-hmm. Uh, from mm-hmm. and he's who's yeah. also in Job Work as well in the first one. Um, yeah, yeah, we've seen him one other time. Do you know what that was in? Oh God, um, is it something like Cody Banks? Where he's no, nah, like it's it's like a it's like a post fame? fame thing. It's a post fame yeah. thing. It would have been hot off the heels Daddy's of Game of Thrones. <laughs> I'm gonna no. I'm gonna put all my all go put all my chips on Daddy's Home that Alfie Allen appears. Uh, in. No, but that is the Hilary Duff film. No, it's not. Uh, no. She's in Daddy's Home. No, <laughs> um, he is in the Predator, the Shane Black one. Yes, he is. Yeah, and yeah. also yes. Yeah, so interestingly, this was something that it, I. I found crazy watching the second film. So Hilary Duff does not replies, reprise her role, much like in another franchise that she's in. Um, <laughs> I can't believe you're not telling me this. <laughs> what an annoying thing to listen to this must be, because it's presumably really obvious. To everyone is. else is like, you it know, is. AJ, the Hilary Duff vehicle that everyone yes, else can l- name literally. without a second thought. How is it not Lizzie McGuire? Then? If, if, if you... Duff- Literally, like, if you think of Hilary Duff vehicles... Give me a, any clue. Give me a clue. Uh, it, it does a lot... It, this film does a lot better of the um, filling out roles with character actors, I think. To the point where we actually commented oh on this God. when we covered it. Um, is she... She is in a Cinderella story. Yes. You're so right. Yeah. I did it, everyone. Completely Fuck obvious you. as well. <laughs> Fuck you all. What, what? Fuck you all. I did it. I did it. <laughs> yeah. I knew you would get it, AJ. Um, Thank you. But yeah, the she she doesn't reprise her role in the second one. The the quote unquote love interest. They don't. They're not really an item, but she fills the sort of female lead role in this one. Um, in the second film, is well, played. She, she's revealed to be another secret yeah. agent for the the British. Uh, we kidnapped children and trained yeah. them like, in the military. Although, although it's she's, like, it's basically just recruiting children yeah. for the military. So, but yeah, it's interesting because and, her and more like Agent Coney Banks. There you go. Nice, very Because he also has child soldiers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a good um, joke. That was, thank Wish you. Wish I'd thought of that in a more, al- and delivered that in a more elegant <laughs> way. Uh, yeah, so she is played by an actress named Hannah Spirit. And when she showed up, I was like, I recognize her, but where from? Uh, she was she was a member of S Club 7, 
uh, is where I know her from. Uh, I, um, I knew it'd be something like that because she is the prime example of what I'm talking about. Why the hell do I not know the name of the Hillary Duff replacement in Agent Cody Banks too? Oh, yeah. Like she, it should be Amanda Bynes. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah, it's right. written to be or Selena Gomez. The, the, yeah, exactly, like exactly. In a Cinderella story. Yeah. Um, Correct. But the but yeah, Hannah Spirit. If I hadn't got it yet, and you were like, you know, AJ liking a Cinderella story, and I'd be like, yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> just like in a Cinderella story. Uh, but yeah, interesting. Like, I, I, it's funny because I remember watching like the S Club TV series that they had around this time, and and S Club Seven, you know, the height of their popularity. Like, when when was um Reach by S Club Seven? I I do think if you're listening to this, that was came out in two thousand, so four years before. Edgy Cody Banks too. If you're listening to this in the US, I don't think S Club really made it over there. Um, let me know if I'm wrong, but I, I, maybe, I think it might be a thing of Steps. Steps definitely did not I don't know how much S Club did. Is S Club um, uh, and S Club 7 like a Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z situation, or you were just shortening S Club 7 uh, to S Club? Th- uh, they, some members left and they um, became just S Club. No longer seven. Yeah. No um, longer seven. I, I, I think they toyed with being like East Club 5 for a little bit, but they, they just went by East Club. Um, Seven's a lot of people for a fucking yeah. band. But yeah, so it was this like this pop band. They That's why they like, left. Some, <laughs> some fucking, uh, they're like, you don't need us. But they, yeah, they had some, they had some big bangers right at the turn of the millennium. But yeah, Hannah Spirit was one of them. Rachel Stevens, who I mentioned earlier, should have played the hot chick, was also in East Club 7. Um, she was the one I had a crush on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember like watching her the hot chick. <laughs> in 2000 in the in the, these music videos, these TV shows, and being like, that's an adult, you know? Like, I was seven at the time, mm-hmm. and it's like, yeah, these are like full on adults. Now, four years later, watching her in Agent Cody Banks 2, like, you know, 20 years later now, watching her at that age, I was like, she doesn't even look of age as a, like, she looks 16. <laughs> Um, she looks younger than the the disturbingly underage Hillary Duff was in the first film. Yeah, but uh, but then <laughs> she she's clearly made up to look younger. And then at the when it's there's the reveal of who she is, um, and that she's in the MI six or whatever. She she dresses a lot more maturely and and clearly has like her office job. So mm-hmm. I think her character is implied to be like twenty four um, or something like that, like slightly well, slightly she still older. Kisses- I would say canonically 16 year old Cody Banks she does and she she wanted them to be an item but the producers nixed it but anyway this is all to say we have seen Hannah Spirit once before do you know what that was in ah no I couldn't I couldn't begin to tell you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't pick Freddy up on Freddie vs. Jason. Seen it. I'll pull a pull a You're random one out. Kind of close. It's it's that vein. Mm. Do you want to you want to mm-hmm. keep keep going yeah, keep bet. going? Uh, the the Hellraiser that's about how Hellraiser is actually a video game. The, like, again, again, close that you're probably um, the, your years <laughs> wouldn't line up, but yeah, it's, it's around this era. Um, but mm-hmm. it's 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 a horror franchise that yes yeah, started to get a bit silly. Yeah. Uh, okay. It's it's uh, Rob Zombie's Halloween. No, it was uh, this franchise was in the news in the last couple of days actually. Um, Nightmare on Elm Street. No, because that's having an anniversary coming up. Mm. I don't know. No, uh, who is it? she is in Seed of Chucky. Well, what is it? Which uh, the TV show was just cancelled the other day. Yes, it was. Mm. And everyone's like, it'll come back. It's Chucky. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No one's worried. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, <laughs> Don Mancini's like, I made like an $11 sequel <laughs> in feature film form <laughs> when he did like, what, 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 like the second to last Chucky movie it was so cheap, but yeah. it's like, it's still pretty good. <laughs> yeah, totally. The budget's lacking, but it's still pretty good. Yeah, was that Cult or Curse of Chucky? Cult, definitely cult, yeah. Cult was the last one before the reboot. Um, um I don't think we said this, but what do you think the first one has on Rotten Tomatoes? I reckon it's got forty two percent on Rotten Tomatoes. You're quite close, uh thirty eight percent. Mm-hmm. And I reckon Destination London has twenty seven percent on Rotten Tomatoes. You're a little bit further off with this one. It has fourteen percent. Uh, it's even lower. Yeah. Um what yeah, is this one I about? mean this one, I mean, it's all Agent Cody Banks, London destination. Mm. That's what he does. He's assigned to a mission that requires him to be in London for some reason. I can't remember the like, the like story engine, but Stokes, I remember yeah. it is it is stupidly similar to the setup of the first film. Like it's like there is a another scientist who is in over his head, 
um, <laughs> with tech. In this case, it's uh, mind control technology, yeah. mm. uh, and it's getting into the wrong hands. And Agent Cody Banks has to go undercover at a a prestigious music school where um, I had seen this before because mm. I had ingrained into my memory um, a scene where he has to prove he can play the clarinet, and it's playing "Flight of the Bumblebee" by itself because it's a spy gadget, mm. uh, and then he pretends to play it and then it goes off before he's ready and he has to quickly pretend to play it again. And I always remember thinking this would obviously give the game away to anyone looking, but for some reason it's movie magic. And he, what with the guy who turned us back? Mm, Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, Yeah. So he has to go to London and it's just a stupid little adventure. Uh, Look, (laughs) it's a lot less creepy than the first one. I enjoyed this one. But I also, did you really? I feel like this is just like pound for pound, like, at least oh, pound for dollar. Good movie. Pound. <laughs> very good. At least, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I just didn't enjoy it as much. It was a lot more of a slog to get through. I think for. Oh, it was still um, a slog to get through. Don't don't bloody get me wrong. Yeah, yeah. No, it sounds like you loved it, Richard. Um, I did. Like, it sounds like the only thing you loved more than Destination London was how much you love uh, being creepy to 15 year old yes. yep. girls. Yep. Uh, it so, was funny. Like, I got, I got to where you were going. Before yeah. you could Thank get you it out, and so I was just me. just waiting. Thank you for yeah. being <laughs> with me. Um, I think so. This whole th- the whole through line we've been talking about with these movies is that it's clear. I think it was clearly they wrote a bit more of a prestigious cast in mind for both films, and then could only get one or two biggish names hmm. to fill. <laughs> they got Ian McShane, like seven or eight bigger names. Yeah. Ian McShane, by the way, in the first film, dies when an ice cube with the nanobots is put mm. in his mouth by Hilary Duff. That's, Murderer. It's this, <laughs> Murderer this, Hillary uh, Duff. The, yeah, one of them, one of the, a henchman, I think, gets like fucking fully like eaten by these nanobots and it's pretty fucking disturbing. No, it's it's Ian McShane. That is he Ian, swallows yeah, right, this okay. and, he, and he gets... Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark style, the bad guy, how his face is melted yeah, off. Yeah. It's like of that caliber. And you just watch in this movie that's mostly felt like it's for kids, except for when it's overtly sexual and all of a sudden it feels like it's for pedophiles. Um, but, even, but in this movie that doesn't have anything nearly as violent in it, suddenly has Ian McFace's face, like, like <laughs> the McFace. bones in his... <laughs> Ian McFace. <laughs> I'm so excited to talk about this. Like, you see his cheekbones get dissolved and his face sink in. Mm. Like, it reminded me of in Skyfall when Javier Bardem takes out mm. his, like, prosthetic jaw and his face, like, sinks into itself, which is like, that prosthetic, I've always thought this, that's pro- that prosthetic jaw in Skyfall, you have nothing to worry about. Uh, Silver, it's doing a great job. You look yeah, like yeah. Javier Bardem when you put it in. Um, so like you know, like it's it's just this absurdly violent thing. But what I'm saying is, it's so, so it is also true of Destination London that I feel like these roles were written for like a little higher caliber, totally. recognizable name because there is like a British Q character where he's like teaching Cody Mm. Banks about all the different gadgets. And it is the stupidest, most American writing a British stereotype character. I've, it is so fucking, he's like the snivelly little dude with a mustache and he's just erratic and talks like, it's just such a, yeah, he should be played by Eric Idle. It should be played by Eric Idle. You're so right. In a role, I know he is not above because I have been doing, a little podcast called Film Franchise Fortnite <laughs> for eight years, and I have seen Eric Idle and John Cleese play the most. Um, well, I mean, John Cleese actually ruining... played Q as well. There you go. They play the most legacy ruining characters in movies where half of the budget would have gone to pay them. Well, right? Eric like, Idle I was in um, these guys. Uh, Randy's Christmas Vacation 2, whatever it was called. Randy's Summer Vacation. A perfect example. A yeah. perfect example of how Eric Idle just has no standards for what roles he takes. Yeah. It is such a wannabe. It is a just. It is an annoying performance. He's only in like one or two scenes. Yeah. <laughs> Every time he shows up, it's like, blow my brains out. This is the most like unfunny surface like like it's ah oh god so annoying and one of many very annoying performances in this film i think yeah one thing it, it is funny though because um harold Zwart didn't return because of budgetary um issues uh, mm. they refused to 
Um, they refused to move the budget too much and all the stuff he wanted extra. And then, so he ran, he, he left and then Kevin Allen was directed because he like had done all these indie comedies and stuff beforehand. Um, and, but they said they want this one to be less sort of CGI heavy, um, and more, and more funny. So that's why it's crammed with a lot more mm. jokes and silly characters like that one. Um, and they, they all land, don't they? They all, <laughs> all land. They jokes. sure do. So one thing that's interesting, you, AJ, you're a you're a mid two thousands director. You're a little bit of a hack, let's say. Um, and yeah. your sequel takes place in London, and so you have the characters in the back of a car, and that's and they say, "What? I have to go to London?" You cut to various uh, shots of the London skyline. The, the clock, the big clock, the big clock, the Millennium Eye. Um, what song are you using for this? Like, what what's going to be undercutting this? Well, I'm going to use London Calling, obviously. Exactly, by The Clash. Which, which is um, I, presumably a very cheap uh, song because it's within an... the realms of the budget of Agent exactly, Cody Banks exactly. 2. In fact, you would almost, you would almost think, um, hey guys, I know it's a lot of money, but let's actually set aside a hefty chunk of the budget <laughs> yeah. to get London Calling. Yeah, because exactly. Because the scene clearly needs it. Yeah, and so... Any any film that t- that cuts to London uses London calling. It's there's there's compilations of it. It's very it's so cliche. It's very funny, but yeah, they they couldn't afford the rights to London calling. No, they could not. So um, the director got in hold. What 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 replaces it is what I'm guessing, and I don't have the information, so I'm looking mm. forward to hearing the story behind this. Is an original song written for Agent Cody Banks to Destination London, where the only thing the producer or the director told the musician was it needs to remind people of London <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes um it's he got a hold of um yeah this martin ace from the band man uh to write a song called destination <laughs> london and it's literally like it starts off with a sort of like um that sort of you know punky or scar inspired um type mm-hmm. riff that london calling starts with and then it's just like london Destination yeah. London, <laughs> yeah, like, <it> just, <laughs> <laughs> like, like when who's who's London calling by? The Clash. So when the Clash sing London in the song London, that that when they go London and you you would go calling, but it's like they've got that sound bite <laughs> yeah. and they've surrounded it with a different song. Yeah. So you your brain goes, it's London calling, yeah, because it's it's it would be like if I went somebody. Yeah. You know, like it's that kind of like brain chemistry being like, <laughs> yeah. I recognize that. But then your brain goes, these lyrics are about uh, seemingly Cody Banks specifically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't think that this is London calling anymore. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, it and was what's very great funny. is it's solving a problem. <laughs> I, it's solving a problem by using the song. It is solving a problem that they're like, "Oh, our movie can't be as cliche as we want it to be. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we yeah, we yeah, can't yeah. use London Call. Just yeah. use a different song, then." Oh yeah, Kevin. Just any any anarchy in the UK by the Six. Yeah, Pistols. they're great. <laughs> what was like? What was two thousand and four UK music? Top ten singles. Uh, you've though. got a uh, big, big city life. <laughs> Fuck <laughs> yeah, dude. Big city life. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Which is would be tonally such a different mood to to do your "I've arrived in London, look at the clock" montage. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> big city life, my child forget by Big city life. Uh, what else could you have nice. had from that year? Air hostess by Busted. Could it's a Busted? Uh, yep. Yeah, that would could've. be great. Could Fuck it, it I don't want you back by Amon. I'm gonna no, I'm gonna go to give you credit. Busted, not an uncody Banks band. Totally, not a band. I would be, I would be like, what the hell if I saw them on the the yeah. soundtrack? You know. Thank you for giving me that credit, AJ. Um, Toad, no, you're you're so right. <laughs> um, it was yeah, just but- it was just buried under how often you bring up Busted, regardless of <laughs> so. Um, but what well, interestingly is what that um this Agent Cody Banks two Destination London speaking of the soundtrack uh, actually contains um Walkie Talkie Man by Stereogram which is a Kiwi song Kiwi band totally yes um, yeah which was yeah. I I this Skippy Williamson referenced it um trying to, I think during New Zealand Music Month was like they should cover Agent Cody Banks because the sick one has Stereogram in it uh 
but otherwise I would have been quite surprised to hear uh, that song. But instead, I was uh, I got through the whole first film and was like, huh, maybe I'm misremembering that. And then it showed up in the second film, mm-hmm. and I was like, ah, he did it. He got it. He got me. Should have guessed this when it wasn't in the first one. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, do you have anything else you want to say about Agent Cody Banks 2, Destination London, or do you want to move on? I don't think I have anything else to I, I want to say about it. You see the camp that he mm. that they not allowed to tell their parents about in this. There's a whole sort of uh, there's you see more young secret agents in this one, uh, which each younger than made the it last. creepier, but uh, <laughs> yeah, pretty kind of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so, Agent Cody Banks actually has one of the more interesting continuing the franchise segments we've done i don't know mm. if you remember this or if this came across your tiktok feed or whatever a couple of years ago i va- i know what you're going to talk about yeah, yeah. so um, i want you to to have the honor to relay it thank you to yeah. me and the um because so frankie Muniz was on the steve-o podcast a couple of years ago and this was when it sort of came because there was all this stuff about like frankie Muniz doesn't remember filming malcolm in the middle doesn't remember malcolm in the middle yeah, yeah. and so because because he sort of he'd said on another podcast like you know i don't remember filming it um really and people talked about like oh you know he's been it, it was it was put out there as if like he, he got so drug fucked he got so um and they say this to him in mm. the podcast they're like i read that and i thought it was like you know you had to be told like you were in a tv show like um and he just says like no, mm. like think about like your nine to five office job do you remember every single day of it like no you remember the mm. big stuff but if someone if if your day-to-day job became huge and, and famous and people are asking you about the specific thing you did on September 4th, 2003. Mm. Are you actually going to remember that? It's like, no, it's the same thing. And yeah, like totally fair enough. But they asked him about, is there... Um, I think a, sorry, a relatable version for this is when you or I listen back to an old episode of this podcast mm. and it's all new information to me, yeah, yeah. you know, like, like I also am like, how could you forget? Like, like sure. Like you would forget your supermarket nine to five, but mm. like, if you're like engaging with a story and a totally. script, like surely you would remember more, but no, it, you totally wouldn't because I don't remember what we talked about. Especially we talked it, about fucking romancing the stone. Yeah. You know, I don't remember a thing about that episode. Especially. I don't remember a thing about the movies. Except for where um, I was when we were. <laughs> yeah. 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 That is, yeah, that, exactly. that is an interesting thing that I, um, I, without fail, I think I could tell you like where I was when we recorded or when I watched any of the films we've covered on the podcast, um, which is often like how I remember when I moved house and things like that. Yeah, um, same, because same. I remember what franchise we were like. I remember um, one, for instance, that like I moved house during the MCU when we were recording that because we were recording that in little chunks as well. Mm. Um, anywho. What I was saying, uh, they, so they ask him on the podcast uh, if there's any talk of like a Malcolm in the Middle reunion or like an Agent Cody Banks, and those are the two ones they bring up specifically. He says that Malcolm in the Middle has been there's pretty serious talks at any given time. Brian Cranston mm-hmm. is writing a script. He says the main thing is that they the studio wants to do it as a movie, and the cast are kind of like unsure about that. And this was like conversations for the started in 2016 before it was like everything was being rebooted the way it is now. Like now it's only a matter of time mm-hmm. before every show from your childhood comes back. But um I will say though, no one knows where Eric Pierre Sullivan yeah, so that's- no one knows where he is. Yeah. He's disappeared from fame. Yeah. So he said, and you know, fair enough. He, good he's on not him. missing. He's not yeah. a missing person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like, he, yeah, he wasn't at a recent reunion. I say recent, like you know, in the last four or five years. But um, yeah, he said. All, I reckon that was ten years ago, dude. I reckon <laughs> probably. the reunion you're talking um, about was 2013. But he said, <laughs> yeah, they they got every all act, every actor except one was keen to return. Um, which I'm presuming was Eric Sullivan. Sullivan. But anyway, they asked him about um, Asia Cody Banks, and he said that yeah, MGM pitched him two ideas so one is um that just a third family film he's now older and he's training the next generation and then the other one which is like super interesting is the kind of thing that you or i would pitch for this Mm -hmm. um is a in fact it's kind of annoying that it's already floating out there and so it's far more interesting than what i've planned for a continue totally i haven't even planned anything i was just gonna make it up but the (laughs) But yeah, the idea is an animated show, um, similar sort of in tone to Bojack Horseman, and he, he mentions that as a reference. But this idea of um, 
imagine a kid spy all grown up like you saved the world as a child your life is never going to get better than that um and it's like what a what a insane concept for a like that that's an interesting adult cartoon pitch anyway mm. and it's and it's just riffing on this kind of movie but it's like yeah throw the actual agent cody banks ip on it is a fantastic idea um and so and he sort of says that the idea is like oh james bond's not available and it's like well fuck let's get this like fucking washed up agent cody banks to save the world then um mm. and god i want to see that it's it's such a good idea Re- and, redemption story yeah. Yeah, yeah um and yeah he he, he said like he doesn't say why it didn't happen because they start just talking about Kingsman instead. But the um, and then they talk about like, yeah, I actually don't watch big budget movies. Um, but the and Steve, I was like, yeah, man, yeah, that's man, like, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, dude, like, I, I can't watch like the Marvel movies, dude. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but he, yeah, anyway, he's, let he's, me go and <laughs> knock myself out and jump off a building. Yeah. Do you see this his whole thing about how he was going to surgically get um, breasts, and then like mm. the day of the surgery, he like just ran into a trans person at the supermarket and was like, "Is this funny or is this stupid?" And they were like, "That's stupid." And he was like, "You know what? I'm not going to do it then." Um, the most insane thing about that story is that it happened. He met that person the day he was getting the surgery. Yeah. Like, like it is a much more forgivable story if it's like I thought about it, talked to some friends, decide like the a something was penciled in yeah is what that story tells me the <laughs> the surgery had been booked yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he got that far he probably put it he put a deposit on it. yeah um and then also so funny that like the decision he reached was no i should not get breast implants mm. yes yeah, steve-o you shouldn't that <laughs> i could have told you that he wasn't i i believe he wasn't gonna have them permanently um, it was it was some statement no, but about still, like that's topless even, that's even shit, grislier, yeah. right? Like yeah, what yeah. a what a um flaunting of wealth in a lot of ways. Yeah, harder, yeah. You could just get them and then get them removed. Uh, yeah, but um, but anyway, yeah, Frank Mendes says that he really wanted this to happen, and it just I don't know with the studio. It's it's interesting. Like the studio pitched to him, he seemed keen, and then it just didn't happen. But he said like you know now that I'm putting the idea out there in the in the ether, maybe it'll come to fruition, but. As far as I know, no updates. I could that. see, like, maybe this is just because Bojack Horseman was brought up, but like, I would Agent Cody Banks the animated series, and this is what it's about, and he mm. returns to to voice Cody totally. Banks. Like, I'd I think that that would work. I that would that like I don't need this to be a movie for the idea to be explored. I don't care. Mm. I don't care. It can be no, a yeah, he's, no, he's saying yeah that, that it, it would be it would be a series. Um, this idea i it would right okay yeah so, right. so this one yeah series like that or the other option is literally just do another family film where he plays the mentor role mm. Mm. my so, continue the franchise richard is a similar thing but instead of focusing on Co- cody banks as a as an adult let's focus on um natalie hillary duff's mm. character and explore how does someone reconcile with knowing that they put an ice cube full of nanobots mm. in a man's mouth and watched his bones dissolve um like where where does that take a person like she is suspiciously absent nary a mention in destination yeah, london yeah. i think she could be in therapy totally you know? i think she's like changed the trajectory of her life by murdering ian mcshane mm. I I think um my my film my pitch is um similarly follows a side character uh is that you know this this kid we see barreling down the hill towards this train in the first film uh mm. how do you live knowing that you're living you're you're living on borrowed time and that if agent Cody Banks hadn't mm. been around to save him he would have been mm. train meat and uh wow train me yeah. there's your title jesus it's called train me yeah train me yeah. yeah and uh, it's it could be uh, like a final destination we're, we're, style uh, thing you've got this you've got this mother <laughs> who um swears that this child was able to stop the train and, and, and he you know he sped off so no one believes her um mm. and you know she's obviously dealing with the fallout that like her her kid was was supposed guilt, to die there. You know, the guilt. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. It's called Train Meat, and it's uh, very um, not affiliated with it's Bradley R-18. Cooper's The Midnight Meat Train. Um, Don't even talk about that. Yeah. Um, I think we're stumbling onto something interesting here, which is maybe like an original idea, unless I continue the franchise. But like, what about like a support group for adults who experienced trauma, like traumatic events, as children? Right, that's the premise of the mm. movie. But as you learn That's what, what each traumatic event, 
was um it's revealed that each traumatic event is like a side they were a side character in a big budget family blo- blockbuster from the early 2000s mm. like it was a wacky scenario like like someone's really disturbed because when they were a kid um i don't know a a a De- a, a kangaroo wearing a red jacket like kicked their dad or something mm. off off a building you know you know what i mean like like these things that are just like fodder in the background of something like big fat liar stayed with someone who saw it at a an impressionable age and now they have this like there's like the special adult therapy for trauma that is ridiculous yeah, the, totally. for trauma that is um like silly antics in a and when they were the background character of a stupid kids movie hmm. you know something like some people from cracked.com would write totally yeah it was always like one of my dreams that when i was going to be like this famous filmmaker and i make a a, a world f- and don't steal this idea if you're listening um that you make this sort of like very well regarded like action film that all and also like like importantly like one that like does not need a sequel or like it has it ends in a way that couldn't have a sequel. Um, Meet Train, Train, yeah, Train, sorry. and um, but anyway, then, then years later would make like a follow up film, which is just like it's just a drama about someone's life. You know, there'll, there'll be some other hook in it or whatever. And then at the end, it's revealed that they were like one of the cannon fodder that was killed in like the opening scene of this other movie, um, and it was mm, called Secondhand nice. Man. Someone suggested that to me as a title once, and I always liked it. Nice. Well, it's all out there, you know. Maybe just like the Agent Cody Banks mm. three that Frankie Muniz put out into the ether. Maybe someone will steal your idea. Exactly. I guess that was what were you talking about? That was your goal, right? Yeah, yeah. The very. <laughs> um, <laughs> I like how you talked about someone listening to my idea, stealing it for their own, Frankie Muniz, and didn't make a big fat liar joke. No. Didn't even occur to me. <laughs> All right, it's time to Big Fat Liar Three should be about someone stealing Frankie Muniz's idea for Agent Cody Banks. <laughs> yeah, uh, AJ, it's time to rank that franchise over at Letterbox.com, where we have a ranked list of every franchise we've covered from uh, what's number one these days, from Before Sunrise to Dungeons and Dragons, the 2000 series. Not uh, lost where I put fucking Agent Cody Banks now. Uh, not the recent one, which was actually not that bad. But anyway, Agent Cody Banks, Agent. Yeah, do you think the, it goes? the the recent one, which would single handedly bump that entire franchise well from from like uh, last place. I reckon. Yeah, I reckon it would. Where, at least where put does it Agent above Cody Banks go? Scorpion King, which is second to last. Uh, Agent Cody Banks. Do you think it's uh, better or worse than Speed? I think it's worse. I don't think it offers. Like and you would agree, right? You you rated them both two and a half stars. Yeah. Okay. So I reckon we're below the nymphomania. Sorry, the speed ah. constant. Uh, is it ah. better or worse than um, fellow spy franchise Pierce Brosnan's uh, Bond films? Worse. Yep. Is it better or worse than fellow Ian McShane uh, franchise Pirates of the Caribbean? Worse. Yep. Is it better or worse than fellow Arnold Vosloo franchise, The Mummy, 1999? I think it's worse, yeah. Okay, what's another one? Is it is it better or worse than Har- fellow Harold Zwart franchise, The Karate Kid? Yeah, this would be worse than The Karate Kid, okay. all up. Or would it be? What do you think? Uh, I, yeah, what do you- Am I misremembering The Karate Kid as, be- as having more value as a franchise than it does know. is it better or worse than a fellow um anthony anderson franchise harold and kumar i reckon it is uh i think i think i would rather watch these than any harold and kumar movie but i okay. bet that's not the general consensus <laughs> uh okay what's, so what's below harold and kumar american pie yeah, let's put this between American Pie and Harold and Kumar. Totally, okay. totally. That actually makes complete sense to me. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, AJ, it's there. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Christ. Uh, so that is number 123 now. Uh, time to head over to a couple other things we got to do, don't we? Um, 
we're going to have to reveal the next franchise and it's going to be a game of franchise roulette but aj there's something a little bit special about this one isn't there yes because we forgot that usually we make all of october a halloween month and only do spooky franchises but we forgot um so agent cody bags is the first franchise of spooktober 2024 uh however i was thinking we did do the shining and doctor sleep pretty recently yeah. so maybe we can so be t- like, give us a fucking that break that was in place yeah <sighs> but yeah, we're we're doing a spooky duology mm. for next next Fortnite's franchise, uh, and we're going to draw a random number to decide which spooky yeah. franchise, which so, spooky duology. Yeah, and do. interestingly, so of our franchise list of our two film franchise list, I took out all the non horror or horror adjacent ones. There's a couple ones that aren't really horror, but they have horror elements and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. There was twelve films. I went through. I thought about it, and um, there's now forty five on this list. Um, no, so some great, that, that went job. on some went on the list um so mm-hmm. yeah very interesting to see what we land on because some of these i was like oh yeah i forgot that exists and i'm kind of keen to watch it 23 23 okay okay 23 holy shit <gasps> oh my god Jim it's Carrey everywhere on the phone um ah uh, now annoyingly for me there's actually a cinema near me playing uh, the first film in this two film franchise um, that I wanted to go to uh, on, I believe, give Halloween me the decade Day. it's from. Uh, oh, you don't know off the top of your head. That's interesting. Eighties uh, and twenty tens. Okay. Oh, so quite a big mm. jump. Eighties and twenty tens. Is it? Um, is the first one particularly well regarded? Incredibly so. Okay. Uh, is it like a straight up horror or is it one of these horror adjacent ones? You uh, it's of? it's definitely a horror. A horror duology that had one in the 80s and one in the 2010s. Have, have we, do Although, you know if we've seen either of them? I, uh, we've both seen the first one, I believe. I don't know if you've seen the second one. No. Oh, that doesn't help me. You look perturbed. What has changed? Well, is there a third one? There's technically another one <laughs> what could this mean richard hmm. Hmm. do we do we scratch it and do do it roll again maybe maybe do you want to watch this franchise i do very much but yeah i think maybe there is a, 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 it's, it's technically a remake the first one Oh dear, a remake in the 80s that then got... Is it The Thing? It is The Thing, yeah. Well, we're screwed anyway, because that's part of John Carpenter's Apocalypse trilogy. So there's actually like six of these. (laughs) I reckon let's keep this in, because it's funny, and the world can know what they missed out on, because (laughs) of the two-film franchise mandate. Let's roll again, baby! Okay, so it's now out of 44. (laughs) Actually, I should change that, because it's still out of 45. I was just going to hope it wasn't. All right, here we go. Hmm. Two. <laughs> oh my god, it's everywhere. Okay. Just like Agent Cody Banks too. Okay, now to just double check I've got my my stuff right here. Um mm-hmm. You've got your stuff right there. Yeah, I do. Uh Okay, so yeah, this is a Okay, so this is a trilogy. <laughs> uh the, this is uh i'd call this more of a thriller um and mm. it's 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 a classic example of like did you know there's a sequel ah okay what era what era are we talking uh 2000 okay have i seen it uh, yeah i think so have you seen it i've seen the first one i can't um, imagine you've seen the second one God, and so the second one's like an obscure sequel then. Uh, it's not this, but it's it's along the same vein as American Psycho 2. Is it Donnie Darko? It is Donnie Darko. Ah, oh, that's so cool, man. That's such a great one to do for Halloween. <laughs> I think that's great. Like, that's totally spooky. The fucking rabbit? Like, that's yeah, great... I, but it's, it's, it, it's, it's definitely great... more of a thriller than a horror. Totally. But also... We are finally going to watch S. Darko, the sequel that no one ever talks mm. about. 
I've wanted to watch that movie for years, dude. Like, <laughs> this is going to be so interesting to finally be able to, like... Like, you're right, American Psycho 2 is, like, a, the exact same thing, where yeah. it's, like, this beloved movie has this god-awful sequel that no one has even ever seen. Yeah, which is um, interesting, wow. like, that um, American Psycho is number one on the list, so... Um, I think we were making the list we clearly thought of last <laughs> at the same time. S. Darko, also played by Davy Chase, who, who is Samara from The Ring and Lilo of Lilo. Yeah, and, and now Stitch, wasn't she like... that one where she was played by Dakota Fanning. Yeah, and then didn't we... Weren't we like going to reach out to her or some shit when we covered Lilo and Stitch and then she was like in prison or like had just gone to DUI she or had, something? She had... Some kind of DUI situation, which, you know, I'm not going to pretend to know her entire story. She just seemed like a, the type of famous person who would be interesting to talk to because her projects were so strange and like totally um iconic and different she ways. was arrested for but joyriding cool. in a in a stolen car uh, fuck yeah <laughs> um that's a cool crime to be for. <laughs> way cool way cooler than dui yeah dui is like hey you could have killed someone mm. joyride is just like oh you stole a car good on you yeah, we've all done it in gta people should steal more shit yeah um Thank you so much for listening, everybody, to this episode of Film Franchise Fortnites. We'll be back in two weeks for a very spooky episode where we look at Donnie and S. Darko. Um, God, I wonder what S. Darko is even about, dude. It's what about is his, that movie his, even his about? Sister. That's all I know. That's mm. so interesting. I wonder his if the rabbit is. will be in it. <laughs> Sister S. <laughs> um, yeah, if you enjoyed this, please follow us on all the various social medias that you follow your podcasts on and jump in the Discord or jump on the Patreon if you want to give us some money. That would be nice if you want to. Um, you can tell us which films to watch and you can also give us something to talk about the post credit scene, which is coming at you after this music ends. Uh, but other than that, Richard, we have done our diligent duties. Sk- Skippy Williamson is hopefully very happy with our coverage of the Agent Cody Banks films. We'll see you next time for um, another movie franchise that's just named after the team main character <laughs> Agent Donnie Darko wow there goes that's my Destination franchise <laughs>
it doesn't have yeah. the same juxtaposition it's like yeah you want a really happy song for something really depraved to be going on i'm i'm sorry i'm gonna have to go into like my spotify and look at like my pop mix it's of- gotta be a song that's about uh dancing or having sex basically yeah or dancing as a metaphor for having sex um precisely teenage dream fucking love that by song katie perry. by katie perry man and people are hating on her now but like you forget how she got to where she is um i think we need another 10 to 15 years for yeah for i mean i mean she's dream. still probably too um and yeah the- well that's when i'm gonna make a movie agent <laughs> years, so uh all when right, my screenplay will be finished yeah well my 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 two screenplays um as i mentioned earlier um mm. Love song by Sarah Borelli's. No, she. Do you know? Do you know? Well, again, it's too melancholy. Um, like I said, Fidelity by Regina Spector. That's due a. I wish I was a punk rocker with um flowers in my hair by Sandy mm-hmm, Tom. Mm-hmm. What about uh like Forever by the Veronicas? Oh yeah, with four as the number four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's this the is too hard. On. This is too hard. <laughs> Ending um, ending every post credit scene we've ever done with the list goes on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it do be like that though. All right, I wasn't happy with all my choices there. Uh, this is uh, it's a day later now. I'm recording this in the, in the edit booth here in uh, at Carl Popshire. Uh, I've just been listening to my Spotify. I, I jotted down some other ones that I think um, could work. Uh, you got Pieces of Me by Ashley Simpson, you know, redeem her for her SNL performance. Uh, A Thousand Miles by Vanessa Carlton, um, fucking incredible song, um, just that piano riff, I can imagine that being. There's Suddenly I See by Katie Tunstall, which I recently recorded an episode of uh, my other podcast with Carla Laurent about Skater Boy, fantastic song. A um, couple, you know, sort of slower ones, but I think... Um, uh could have their like sort of ironic enjoyment or like people have enjoyed ironically for a long time and could now be unafraid to legitimately enjoy you've got like where have all the cowboys gone by paula cole uh who did the theme song for dawson's creek i don't want to wait which is also a great song and could also you know have another moment in the sun uh anything by james blunt off back to bedlam it's a fantastic album but it was memed to high hell at the time um it's getting an anniversary now and people are starting to respect it um bulletproof by larue fucking incredible song uh super fun and poppy even though yeah, the, the lyrics are a little bit depressing we belong together mariah carey fantastic and uh you yeah, just one i added right at the last moment as i was recording this um black and gold by sam sparrow um could also be yeah, any of these songs it, fucking any song could be in this i also my my instinct is to say separate ways world depart by journey but that already had a little bit of that because there was like a spooky remix of it uh in stranger things but yeah any of these songs any song i like could i could be in this 